Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Madera. I am the director of the Common Read Program here at Queensborough Community College. With me today is Dr. Robin Ford. She's the coordinator of the Common Read. I'd like to welcome you to today's event where we'll be discussing multiple legacies, Julio de Burgos and Puerto Rican writers and artists in New York. This is part of the Common Read based on Rosie Perez's book. This book is currently being read by over 1,300 students on campus and supplemented by over 30 cross-disciplinary events, which began three days ago and will run until March 31st. Our author, Rosie Perez, is a well-known dancer, choreographer, actor, director, and activist. She's one of many Puerto Rican artists in New York. It's my pleasure to introduce our special guest, Dr. Venez, Vanessa Perez Rosario, an associate professor in the Department of Puerto Rican and Latin Studies at Brooklyn College, CUNY. She earned a PhD in comparative literature from the University of California, Davis, with a designated emphasis in critical theory. Her teaching and research areas include US Latino, Latina literature, language, culture, and society, and Latinos in education. She is an associate investigator on the City University of New York, New York State Initiative on Emergent Bilinguals, a project of the PhD program in urban education and the Research Institute for the Study of Language in Urban Society at the CUNY Grad Center. She is also on the board of the Re Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literacy Heritage Project at the University of Houston. Vanessa is author of Becoming Julia de Virgos, The Making of a Puerto Rican Icon, and the editor of Hispanic Caribbean Literature of Migration, Narratives of Displacement. Please join me in welcoming our special guest, Dr. Vanessa Perez Rosario. So um, let me make sure I turn this mic on. So I want to thank you, um, thank Susan for the invitation and Queens Community College for inviting me to be here today to talk about Julia de Burgos. Um, you might be asking yourselves, what's the relationship between Julia de Burgos and Rosie Perez? Uh, so I'll try, to, I'll try to make that connection a little bit, and then maybe after I make my presentation, um, we can talk a little bit more about whether there are other similarities that I missed. But before I start, I'm just curious to know, how many of you have heard of Julia de Burgos before um, you heard about this event? Any hands? No one. OK, great. Um, so you know, Julia de Burgos, so when, when I was thinking about, when I was preparing for this and thinking about what the relationship is between Julia de Burgos and um, Rosie Perez, of course, the obvious similarity is that they're both Puerto Rican. Julia de Burgos is Puerto Rican. Uh, she was born in Puerto Rico and moved to New York in 1940. Rosie uh, Perez was born in New York City, but of Puerto Rican descent. She identifies as Puerto Rican. So that's one similarity. They have that common background, um, that, that common ancestry and connection to the island. Um, another, another similarity is that they're both uh, activists. Um, Julia de Burgos was very active in political, um, in the political movements of the 1930s and the 1940s to, for the independence of Puerto Rico. She, that was something that, was, that she was very passionate about. She wanted Puerto Rico to be an independent nation. And so she fought, using her words, um, using her writing, to try to bring that about, to bring about the independence of Puerto Rico. Um, at the time that she was living there, was this, it was a critical time in the relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico, and she um, was really advocating for a total independence be between the island and the United States, which we know did not come about. 
the United States moved into a different kind of relationship with the island um, that led in part to this mass migration of Puerto Ricans to New York and to other places, but at that time it was primarily New York. And so um, Rosie Perez is sort of a um, part of that continuum. Right? She is born in New York, but um, it's because her parents migrated much earlier during that wave of mass migration of Puerto Ricans to the United States as a result of the developing relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States in the 1940s. Um, so those are some similarities. I know Rosie um, Perez is very active in HIV awareness, but also she was active in, in having the, trying to get the military, the US military, out of the island of Vieques. So that was one of her causes. So in that sense, there's another similarity there, this kind of passion for defending the rights of Puerto Rico, both the land and its people. So those are other similarities, I think, between Julia de Burgos and um, Rosie Perez. Another reason that, that I think that this is kind of an interesting relationship to talk about is because I think so often um, we think of Puerto Ricans in New York as a movement that started in the 1970s. We know that Rosie Perez, with her film, Yo Soy Boricua Pa Que Tu Lo Sepas, I, I assume some of you maybe did see that. Um, there she's obviously very, very much defending the rights of Puerto Ricans in New York. Um, and, and that New Yorican movement that started in the 1970s, well, there were lots of Puerto Ricans before the 1970s who were also fighting for the rights of Puerto Ricans in New York City. And Julia de Burgos is one of those people. So that's another connection between Julia de Burgos and Rosie Perez. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Julia de Burgos. Um, since you are not very familiar with her, just to give you a bit of an introduction to her, and then I'll look at her legacy in New York post 1970s. So the way that she influenced influenced various artists and writers after the 1970s who were part of that New Yorican movement. Um, I'm going to start by just reading a couple of pages, not even a couple of pages actually, just a couple of paragraphs from the opening of my of my book. That that's the cover of the book right there. Mostly because um, I think the first couple of paragraphs give, will give you a sense of why she ends up becoming such an important figure for Puerto Ricans in New York, or at least it's part of what I argue, that, that her death in New York was an important part of the way that she's remembered and the way that she becomes a cultural icon for, for New Yorkans and other Latinos in New York City. In the early morning hours of July 5th, 1953, two New York City police officers spotted a figure on the ground near the corner of Fifth Avenue and 106th Street in East Harlem. As they approached, they saw the body of a woman with bronze-colored skin, once a towering woman at five feet, 10 inches. She now lay in the street unconscious. They rushed her to Harlem Hospital, where she died shortly thereafter. The woman carried no handbag and no identification, and she had no identification on her. No one came to the morgue to claim her body. No missing persons case fit her description. She was buried in the city's potter's field. One month later, the woman was identified as award-winning Puerto Rican poet, Julia de Burgos. Her family and friends exhumed and repatriated her body. So they, so her body, her remains were taken back to Puerto Rico and then she was buried there in a, a mausoleum. They actually ended up moving her body several times once it was repatriated. Uh, it was buried in one place first, and then they built um, a large um, kind of a mausoleum uh, in her honor um, in the park in Carolina where she, was, where she was born. When I began writing about Julia de Burgos, I hesitated to mention her notorious death seeking to move away from these narratives of victimhood that have shrouded her life for more than half a century. I wanted to focus instead on her poetry, on her activism, and her legacy. Most Puerto Ricans already know her story, and many, both on the island and in New York, have been captivated by her life. 
However, I soon realized the importance of recounting even the most difficult details as I introduced her to new audiences. Her migration experience and her death on the streets of New York capture the imaginations of readers everywhere. Julia de Becoming Julia de Burgos builds on recent approaches to her work that focus on movement, flow, and migration. This book proposes a new way of reading Burgos' life, legacy, and work, focusing on the escape routes that she created to transcend these rigid confines of gender and cultural nationalism. It's the way that her story is usually told. So one of the things that I was hoping to do with this book is to focus less on her death, because for so long, people focused on that, that image of her on the street, that she was found by these police officers. Nobody knew who she was. And she's, yet on the island, she's remembered as one of the most important poets of Puerto Rico. And so um, lots of writers and artists made this connection about the way that one of Puerto Rico's national treasures moved to New York and died in anonymity. Nobody knew who she was. She was buried in a common grave. And, and so there was a lot of focus on that idea of tragedy, the idea that when Puerto Ricans move to New York or when Puerto Rican culture moves to New York, it dies. It comes here to die. It can't survive. And so I wanted to counter that, because when I read about her life and the things that she did and the, her legacy among Puerto Rican artists and writers, I saw a different story. I saw her as someone who becomes an icon and a symbol of, um, of power, of resistance, of, of, um, uh, of affirming a Puerto Rican identity. So I didn't see her in the way that a lot of people wrote about her. And that was part of what propels me to write this, this book on her. Um, it, so just to give you a little bit of information about her, we won't go into it too much, but I did, I, there is a handout going around that has um, two, two poems. And I think that it's important if we're gonna talk about Julia de Burgos to at least know a little bit about her poetry. So these are two of her most important poems. And we'll talk just a little bit about poetry and then we'll skip ahead to think about how she's remembered um, in, in um, New York, Puerto Rican culture and literature. So in Puerto Rico during the 1930s, there was this very important group of writers that were called the Generación del Treinta, and they created cultural works that uh, tried to affirm a Puerto Rican identity. They were very preoccupied with this idea of defining what it meant to be Puerto Rican. They were particularly preoccupied with this idea because in the, by the 1930s, Puerto Rico had been occupied by the United States for 30 years, right? roughly 30 years, um, since 1898. And so there, was a, um, there were lots of changes that were going on in Puerto, Rican, um, in Puerto Rican culture, more American influence, more US influence. Um, Puerto Ricans in 1917 became US citizens. So there was this, this desire to define a Puerto Rican identity that excluded U.S. influence. And so this group of writers, the Generación del Treinta, were very preoccupied with this. Um, those writers who wrote about what it meant to be Puerto Rican were very, were very nationalistic and focused on writing um, that was patriarchal. It really focused on, on, there were male writers, men who were writing and defining what it meant to be Puerto Rican. And they used the novel. The novel was their preferred genre for writing about what it meant to be Puerto Rican. And so Julia de Burgos, as a woman and as a poet, living in that very conservative Catholic society at that time, kind of rebelled against that and said, you know, to be Puerto Rican, I, I think part of the reason she rebelled is because she was already excluded in many ways, because as a woman writer, she wasn't imagined as being a central part of the nation. And so she wrote, um, she wrote this beautiful poetry. One of her most well-known poems, two of her well -known, most well-known poems are here on this sheet of paper. One of them, Rio Grande de Loisa, um, is probably her first uh, 
probably her most well-known poem. And, and often this poem is described as being a, kind of a love letter to Puerto Rico, to the nat natural imagery and the um, beauty of the island. And, um, and so even though it seems to be read as kind of a nationalistic love poem to Puerto Rico, I read that poem a little bit differently. And I'm just going to read a paragraph or so that I have written about um, this, this particular poem and the, and the way that it differs from these writers from the, the 1930s. So while the, the writers of the 1930s privileged this, this idea of the novel, um, for them, the idea of pleasure and eroticism of poetry such as this poem they saw it as something that was outside or threatened the nation. The avant-garde poems pr poets provided countercurrents to the work of these nation builders. And Latin American avant-garde or vanguardias are characterized in search of something new, redefinition of art, experimentation, and the creation of various um, magazines. So Julia de Burgos, I argue that with this poem that focuses on waterways, routes, pathways, rivers, um, and, and, a, and the main subject of the poem is a dynamic subject, someone that can't be fixed or contained, that kind of places her as someone who's, who's pushing back against these, this very rigid definition of what it means to be Puerto Rican and this Puerto Rican nationalism of the 1930s. Um, so we'll just read maybe a stanza from, from that poem. Um, I'm going to, let's see, it's down towards, I'll read it in, I'll read it in English, and it's stanza four. So if you have it, you can just follow along there. Rio Grande de Loisa, my source, my river, after the, the motherly petal raised me into the world, with you went down from the rough hills. To seek new furrows, my pale desires, and all my childhood was like a poem in the river, and a river was the poem of my first dreams. So I love the way that she writes here about almost, almost being birthed out of nature. So she kind of rejects this idea of, of um, being, part, uh, being part of this rigid definition of what it means to be um, a part of a Puerto Rican nationalist group. And, and sees herself as being birthed through poetry and through language and kind of giving birth to herself through, through this natural imagery. The poem opens with this, with this sort of metaphorical, rhetorical figure of calling out to an inanimate object to the river and speaks to the river um, and speaks about the power of language but in this conversation through the, through the river, with the river. In awakening the river, the speaker and the river fuse, the subject and the object become one, and the poet births herself in nature, aligning herself with these more avant-garde poets. Um, and in her, and in this poem, if you read the whole poem, you'll see that she seems to suggest that the river and the water connects her to the rest of the world where those writers of the 1930s saw the Caribbean Sea and the ocean as something that separated them, that isolated them from the rest of the world. She's, she's looking to make these connections. So it's not surprising that long, not long after writing many of these poems, she decided it was time for her to leave Puerto Rico. So she leaves the island. Um, and. And I think one of the most significant things that she does after leaving the island and coming to New York, she does move to Cuba for a couple of years and then comes back to New York and dies in New York, uh, lives in New York for about 13 years and then dies in New York. I think one of the most important things that she does is she, she imagines a Puerto Rican identity that's broad enough to in include all Puerto Ricans. It doesn't matter if you were born in New York or if you were born in the island. It doesn't matter if you live in New York or if you live in, in Puerto Rico. Um, the connection to the island through culture, through language, through um, heritage, through, um, through personal experiences makes you Puerto Rican. She, I, she understands that Puerto Ricans who live in New York are part of 
the island, or an important part of the island, and are divided through this question of, of the US um, occupation and infiltration in the, in the island. Um, so in her, in the second poem that you see there, uh, Julia de Burgos, I think she, she talks about her second, I would say her, the other important theme that she writes about. So there are two important themes that she writes about. One is Puerto Rican identity and Puerto Rican politics, and the other is a kind of a feminist identity. And you can see that in that second poem. In that second poem, A Julia de Burgos is probably one of her most, uh, another one of her very important poems, her signature poems. She um, writes about these two sides of herself that are almost at war with each other. There's the Julia de Burgos, who's trying to fit in with society, who's trying to be the Puerto Rican woman that she's expected to be, to, who, who will adhere to social norms. And then there's the poet inside of her who is rebellious and wants to break all of those barriers. And in the end, it's the poet who wins. Um, and she wrote this, again, she wrote this poem shortly before leaving the island and moving to New York. And so we can read maybe just one short stanza, uh, uh, two short stanzas there. To Julia de Burgos. Already the people murmur that I am your enemy because they say that in verse I give the world your me. They lie, Julia de Burgos. They lie, Julia de Burgos. The one that rises in my verse is not your voice, it's mine. You're only the clothing. The essence, though, is me. And the deepest chasm yawns between the two. You in yourself, you in yourself rule not. You're ruled by everyone. In you, your husband rules, your parents, relatives, the priest, the dressmaker, the theater, the casino, the car, the jewels, the banquet, the champagne, and the heaven and the hell, and the what will they say. So you can see here um, where those two parts of herself are dueling, and in the end, um, it is the poet self who prevails, and, and this idea of the poet um, always fighting for freedom is the one who, in the end, wins. If you read, you know, when you have some time and you read the, the complete poem, you'll see that, that that's the way that that poem, that poem ends. Another important thing that Julia de Burgos did while she was here in New York, I'm going to show, this is, um, I can sh share some of these images are in my book, but this is a letter that I uh, came across that hadn't been published before in 1953. So she wrote it just a few months before she died. Um, two months before she died. She writes in this poem, in this letter, let's see, is this the, she wrote the clicker. This is in Spanish, but I have a, a translation of it in the book. But she says that she's, she's in the hospital because she's, bit, she's sick. She's in and out of the hospital over the last uh, couple of years of her life. She, uh, living here in New York, she became an alcoholic and so um, struggled with alcoholism and was in and out of the hospital. But she writes here in these, um, in this, in this letter, that she's sending, she says, dos poemas, te envío dos poemas revolucionarios. So these are her last two poems that she's referring to here. But that sort of rebellious, revolutionary spirit, she never loses it. Um, two months uh, before her death, she's still, she's still writing this sort of passionate political poetry. Um, here's another another image of her, and you'll see how this image is then used, inspires a, a mural in East Harlem by a New Yorkian, um, a New Yorkian visual artist. This is her and, and her partner, a Dominican um, intellectual who she was involved with, and she left the island with him. I, I argue in my book that part of the reason that she left the island were these personal um, for personal reasons. She was married when she was on the island, and um, she, she probably got married around the age of 22, 23, and then divorced her husband. And at that time, 
in the 1930s in a very conservative Catholic society, that was enough to make her sort of an outcast. She was uh, considered, people were very critical of her. A lot of the other poets of the time, the women poets especially, would say things like, we accept Julia the poet, but we can't accept Julia the woman. So they loved her poetry. They, they recognized that she was a very talented poet. But because of personal reasons, they felt that they couldn't associate with her and the kind of woman that they saw her to be just because she'd been divorced. But then um, leaves the island with this man who she was having a relationship with. And uh, he's from the Dominican Republic. He was also, in some ways, um, really struggling against the oppression that was happening in the Dominican Republic at the time that was under the Trujillo dictatorship. So she was, he was fighting against that. So they, there was kind of a meeting of the minds in that they were both uh, revolutionaries in that, in that sense. Here you can see an example of some of the things that she did when she got to New York. She was very active culturally. Um, this is in, in the Bronx, she gave a, this is her first book right here. And this on this uh, Friday, uh, May 10th, she, in 1940, not long after arriving, she arrived to New York in January, she started to build these cultural connections and would give poetry readings and poetry recitals in New York City. Um, and so she became very active and actively involved. And that's part of the, way, the, the reason why I say this idea that she came to New York and never did anything and didn't really contribute to New York Puerto Rican culture, I think, is, is clearly not true. I mean, we can see the ways that she remained very involved um, culturally and, and active as a writer and a political activist. This is Jesus Colón. I, I don't know if you're familiar with, with him, with his work, but he was also a political activist um, here in New York. He moved to New York in 1916. And she became, uh, the two of them wrote together for a Spanish language newspaper that really advocated for the rights of Puerto Ricans in New York City. He wrote a lot about the racism and discrimination that he experienced as a Puerto Rican in New York, as a black Puerto Rican in New York. Um, and wrote, so one of the things that was very interesting about what these early Puerto Rican figures did, which I see, I see also in some of what Rosie Perez did, does, is to advocate for both um, the rights of Puerto Ricans in New York and for the rights of Puerto Ricans on the island. So this is uh, something that they have in common. This is um, this is some the sort of the mission statement of this newspaper that they found that they helped to found and wrote for. It's a Spanish language newspaper that was published in 1940. And Julia de Burgos and Jesus Colón and many other writers, Puerto Rican writers and activists, wrote for this newspaper. And one of the things that they argue in this newspaper or that they set out as their agenda is, um, again, this is here in Spanish, but the unification of all, of all people of Hispanic, at the time they used Hispanos, at the all Hispanophone, the Hispanophone world, um, the desire to, um, counter fascism around the world. Um, and then the independence. So this is kind of an interesting thing here, the, the independence of Puerto Rico, of the nation of Puerto Rico, and the rights of Puerto Ricans in the United States. So they, they are arguing, they're fighting for both, both things at the same time. And I think part of the reason they felt so emboldened to do that is because they're, Port they're US citizens. And they were living here, so they felt that they had a right to claim those citizenship rights here, while also um, advocating for the um, the independence of Puerto Rico on the island. So it becomes this sort of transnational activism that's happening across borders. Another example of how Julia de Burgos was very involved politically. This was for an um, an event that happened in nine. 1946, um, where she's here reciting her poetry and uh, with, along with Jesus Colón, um, right before the, the referendum on uh, statehood and, and independence of Puerto Rico, whether, whether Puerto Rico should become a state or become independent. And this is just a, an example of the, the front page of the 
the newspapers that they wrote for in the 1940s. And you can see here, Julia de Burgos is one of the writers, but there's lots of other um, important writers of that time period. And they were advocating for the election of Vito Marcantonio, who was a, a, um, a councilman from East Harlem. He was Italian, but he, he was of Italian descent, but he supported the independence of Puerto Rico. And because he just supported the independence of Puerto Rico, they all rallied around him and wanted to make sure that he remained in office because he was looking out for their um, concerns. I'm not gonna uh, talk about this particular image too much, but you can see here we're sort of moving into the second part of the book where I look at her legacy and the way that she becomes an important figure in um, visual culture and in, and in the writing by New York writers. This is a visual artist, Lorenzo Omar, who, um, an image that he made. Uh, this, is, obviously, this is Julia de Burgos here, and there's, um, there's a, a, a stanza of her poetry that's included. But I want to focus a little bit more on some of the other images. This is an, uh, one of the most important Puerto Rican, New York artists, um, Juan Sanchez, created this image. It's called Corazones y Flores para, para Julia. And um, he said that this image was created, there's the heart, there's the heart that surrounds her image. It's a collage, but really looking at the important, the, um, sort of the adoration of the Puerto Rican community to, towards her as a, as a creative figure, as a woman. Um, I'm gonna focus on these. We can come back to these uh, when we talk about the Q&A in a moment if, if you have questions. But I wanted to focus on this, on this um, mural. Have any of you seen this mural? Have any of you been to East Harlem 100? This is on 106th Street, um, towards, in between 3rd and Lexington but it's closer to the, the corner of Lexington and 106th Street. And it was created by uh, an artist named Manny Vega. He's uh, a New York artist who works primarily in mosaic. And um, I'll just read a quote. I interviewed him to ask him you know, why, why he had decided to create this mural of Julia de Burgos. How did this this mural come about. And he said that, um, that, that the mural came about because first he was contacted by Hope, Hope Community um, with the idea of creating a mural of Julia de Burgos. Vega's work for a long time had been known as one of the artists who preserves the culture and spirit of the, the cultural and spiritual traditions of the African diaspora in the Americas. And infuses them with elements of contemporary New York, Puerto Rico, and Afro-Brazilian iconography. And he felt that the neighborhood needed something grand, significant, impressive, something that would be a source of pride and that would foster a sense of community. And he also felt that Julia de Burgos herself, as a figure, deserved something majestic. And so his, this is a quote by Manny Vega. This is a, a, from, from an interview that I did with him. He says, what about Julia? What about her spirit? I mean, based on the tra this tragic life and how she was discovered in the streets and died and then all of a sudden was buried in Potter's Field, years later, people flirt with the idea of doing something for her and then it just falls through. There'd be days when I was working alone in my studio and my soul would see Julia walking by, peeking through, opening the door, saying, Manny, gracias, literally because somebody was actually honoring her. And so this mural, he helped to raise the funds for this mural, and it really became a community project. So members of the community watched through the storefront window. He, 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 they gave him a storefront uh, vacant space in East Harlem where he could put this mural together. And they would come by. He worked there as an open studio. People were welcome to come in. Um, and they would come in and help him lay tiles. Others recited poetry or bought flowers and wine. He says that on Friday nights, um, with the music going, Vega and his helpers and, and anyone else who stopped by would jam to sounds of Brazilian beats, Afro-Cuban rhythms, and Puerto Rican timbales. 
According to Vega, he created an art scene all over again. It was like a mini renaissance, and the community loved it. Vega selected excerpts from five poems that he felt represented chapters of, of Burgos's life, and he put them on the studio wall, inviting people to comment on the passages and indicate which one resonated most with them. More than half of the people who participated chose the passage from Myanmar, where you can see there's, you probably can't read it from there, but there's a passage of her poetry there, and then there's a translation. Um, Though it's not one of her best known poems, I think it's a, an interesting poem because in this poem, she wrote it while she was living in Puerto Rico, but in this poem she writes about the, her soul being in exile. So this was something that she wrote about even before she left, and I think that it resonated with the community that saw themselves as, as part of um, this diaspora, this Puerto Rican diaspora. The image of Burgos that, that Vega chose, you might recognize it from that earlier photo, where she had that bow and she's sort of looking forward. So he chose that image, he found it in an archive and he chose that image to be the image that he used to recreate this. Um, the garden at the bottom of the image suggests the poet's love of nature and all that has blossomed and grown from her memory. The tenement building on the left calls to mind New York City. There's a snail that's hidden Let's see if I can find it now. Right there. The snail that's hidden um, in the image is a personal reminder to Vega, to the artist himself, of the methodical and meticulous work that's involved in creating mosaic. And then the pitirre, which is right here. A pitirre is a hummingbird. It was a symbol of the nationalist movement the Puerto Rican nationalist movement, so he embedded it there. And there's Puerto Rico, of course, the Puerto Rican flag. And then this is Atabex, who's a, um, the Taino goddess of fertility. And as a woman, even though Julia de Burgos never had children, um, he, he associates that creativity that she, um, all of her creativity in, in um, producing not only the work that she did, but the legacy that came after all of the writers and artists who were inspired by her work. Um, so he adds that symbol there. He's, Vega, in, Vega involved the area's residents in laying tiles. He says, so that years later, when people walk past the mural, when people walk past the mural with their friends, children, and neighbors, they can say, mira, these are the tiles that I laid. I have a whole bunch of people saying that, and that's why it's the most successful piece of, pub of public art that I've ever created. Not the largest, but the most successful. The mosaic is indeed an enormous success. People uh, gather there regularly, place flowers, candles in front of it. I think here's an image of um, an event that happened a couple of years ago to celebrate Julia de Burgos's death, um, to, rem to remember her death. And so there were musicians and children, and it becomes sort of a public um, gathering space. How am I doing on time? I think. Um, I have lots of other images of murals and other things, but I think maybe I should stop so that there's time for some questions and answers. But this is just, um, I think this is a good image to stop, a good place to stop, because um, you know, this, there was this, this is a beautiful example of the way that people congregate in front of this artwork, and that Julia de Burgos has continued to inspire another generation or several other generations of artists um, Puerto Rican artists and, and writers in New York. So I'll stop there um, and take any questions that you have. Yes, Susan. You mentioned that Julia de Burgos came from Puerto Rico to the United States, went back to Cuba, and then New York. Did she ever go back home to Puerto Rico? She never returned. So the question is um, whether Julia de Burgos ever returned to Puerto Rico after she left. She never returned. Um, and it's, it's interesting, recently, Actually, the same year that my book was published. So my book was published for the centennial of Julia de Burgos. And that same year, a collection of her, poetry, her um, letters were published. And I think that when you read the letters, my sense is that she had a very conflicted relationship to the island. And because of all of the gossip that surrounded her um, during the 1930s, because of the way that she was viewed by many, 
as being sort of rebellious, kind of bohemian, rejecting a traditional life of being married and, and uh, domesticity that would, was expected of women at, at that time. I think she found it very hard, to, difficult to return. And she would write these letters to her sister and say, I'd, um, I'd love to go back to see you and see our mother, who was her mother's grave, because her mother had passed, the, her mother passed before she left. Um, but she said, otherwise, I'll see you in New York. If you are able to come to New York and visit, I'll see you here. And many of her siblings did. I mean, she came from a large family of 13 siblings. So many of them did come to visit. And she had cousins in New York. But she seemed um, intent on not returning to the island. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, so she, uh, because she died in 1953, right? She died, and young, obviously. Young, yeah, she's 39. Um, but that was at a time when things were happening in this country, like the Red Scare was about to happen. Yes. There was a lot of uh, political persecution. Was she ever persecuted in that way, politically, yes. for writing the poetry she did and wanting uh, independence of Puerto Rico? I'd imagine she was, right? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad that you brought up that point. It's hard to fit everything in in a, in a short talk, but that is a very uh, important point. Um, Jesus Colón, the man who I showed, who they collaborated on that newspaper with, um, Jesus Colón is, is an incredible writer, which you should read as well if you have a chance to read his work. He's not a poet, but he writes, uh, wrote short essays. Um, he was a member of the Communist Party. And so her, as far as I know, she never was officially a member of the Communist Party during that time, but, but um, he was. And she certainly, associated, she certainly associated with people who were. And the fact that she wanted the independence of Puerto Rico, that was sort of enough to associate her with the Communist Party. So if we, if we go back to some of these, this, this file, the artist who made this file, Jasmine Hernandez, is a Puerto Rican artist, who, a New York artist. Um, who created this file to make it look like uh, an FBI file, because there was an FBI file that was kept on Julia de Burgos. And in the FBI file, it said very clearly, you know, she writes for the newspaper in New York that is the mouthpiece of the Nationalist Party, and, it's and it was founded by and associated with the Communist Party of America. The, um, Earl Browder, the president of the, of the Communist Party at that time, who was in prison, um, along with the leader of the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, um, Alviso Campos, they founded the, this um, newspaper together. So the Communist Party helped to fund the paper. And that was enough to have a file um, opened on her. So you can see what this artist has done here, subversive. She's considered subversive for, for her um, advocating for the independence of, of Puerto Rico. Other, any other questions, comments? I know it's hard when you're so far away to, to feel like you can ask a question, but I, um, I welcome any question on her. Yes. I don't want to argue, but I have one other thing. <laughs> if you, yeah. um, but there was something else I didn't want to ask. Uh, there was something about, I guess, her first marriage was more, was it, did she leave because she wanted to pursue her career as a poet? I mean, I would imagine that would stifle it. And the other thing was, you did put an image up there I found interesting. Um, I thought I wrote it down. Yeah, it was called Pueblos Hispanios. It had a list of people's names. She was on top. Yeah, that one there. I noticed they were all men except her, unless is it first initial and then the name is that female? No, no, no. Oh, some women do that, right? They're, they're afraid, you know, they don't. They don't. You know what I mean? They're, they'll be like, you know, they, no one will read that work because they'll see it's a woman's name. But she has right. her name up there in full. Yes, it's Milagros. Milagros is another. Yeah, Milagros is a woman as well. But, but you can see that it was primarily this one. But the rest are men, right? All, the rest are men. Yeah. yeah. She was the art and culture editor for, the new, for this newspaper. And this was a newspaper that was partially funded through the Communist Party of America. So that was enough to put her, you know, to have a, a during the era, during the McCarthy era, it was enough to have a paper, um, a file opened on her. I also think that part of her reason for not returning to Puerto Rico, in fact, is that there was a lot of, um, suppression going on of the communist of, of communist sympathizers on the island at that time too. So even though she had hit rock bottom, she was ha she was 
in hard times here in New York. Um, I think part of her reason for not going back also had to do with the fact that I don't know that things would have been much better for her there. I mean, I suppose she would have had her family, but her, her sister was put in prison with her, her, her sister was put in prison with, in Puerto Rico, with her one-year-old daughter. The daughter was also put in prison um, for being a member of the, of the Communist Party. I obviously didn't meet the sister. The sister had passed away before I had a chance to speak with her, but I've spoken to the daughter. So Julia de Burgos' niece, who's the executor of the estate, and she's the one who told me this story, that she said, I was put in prison with my mother um, as a one-year-old child uh, um, because of, because of the, the, way, you know, the, the Red Scare, the McCarthyism that was also um, suppressing any, any one who was affiliated with the Communist Party or a member of the Communist Party or thought of as a communist sympathizer. So I do think that towards the end of her life that that would have influenced her not wanting to return to the island as well. Um, her first marriage, there's not a lot of information that I have been able to find in writing, so it's not too clear to me why exactly she left her first marriage. Her niece told me that it was because her first husband um, was a philanderer and was having affairs, and she decided that she wasn't going to put up with that. I didn't put that in the book because I, I couldn't find any evidence of it. And so that's one of the things about Julia de Burgos. People love her as a figure, and there's lots of stories about her, but it's hard to find a lot of documentation. And so my decision was that if I couldn't find documentation, then I was going, going to leave it out. And so now I've just set it on, on a recording. But that's a little different, right? Because uh, I'm, I'm qualifying that I, it was something that was told to me, and, and I don't know if it's true or not. But I didn't want to put it in the book. I felt uncomfortable putting things in the book that I couldn't find evidence for. And so um, you know, it's not even clear to me whether she had, whether her um, marriage had ended before she started the relationship with this man, that she, this Dominican man who she left the island with. They certainly had a very strong connection. Uh, when they met, there was this sort of, it, the, the way that it's described, it seems like there was, you know, just a, a natural kind of attraction to each other. They were interested in sim similar things. They shared similar ideas about freedom and the world and writing and, and you know, so, it, so all of that is, is hard for me to know exactly when one relationship started and when another ended. There are different dates for different things. Um, so some people, some, some evidence that the relationship started at a certain date and other people's other places they say it started at a different date. So it's not too clear. But you know, that's even something with her birth, although I think that it's, it's quite clear that she was born in 1914. But for a long time, people would say that she was born in 1917. Um, and, and sometimes I think that there is a desire to think of her as this figure that embodies this special time in the history of Puerto Rico. 1917 is the year that Puerto Ricans, um, that of uh, the Jones Act, that Puerto Ricans became U.S. citizens. 1954 is the year that, or 1952, excuse me, is the year that Puerto Rico becomes a free associated state. So she kind of marks that, in, that critical time in the history of Puerto Rico. I think that's part of the reason why there's there, that's sort of the mythology that's been uh, created around her as a figure. I find it ironic that she chose not to go back to Puerto Rico, and yet she's buried in Carolina. <laughs> Do you know who was responsible for bringing her back home? There were a group of um, a group of writers, so the intellectuals in Puerto Rico, that um, that she was sort of a, a part of that circle, and her family. They took her back. I suppose, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. The, the, certainly she should, she, it, it makes sense to me that they would 
not leave her where she was buried. But, but yeah, the decision, they, they worked together and had the body uh, returned to Puerto Rico. Other thoughts, questions? One of the questions that my students always have when we read Julia de Burgos is that they, they, read this, um, they read this poetry where she comes across as such a strong kind of feminist um, figure, and then they're confused by the fact that she was in this relationship with this man, Jimenez Grullon. They're, they're kind of fascinated by this relationship that she was in and that you know he was, he was a Dominican intellectual who was aspiring to be the president of the Dominican Republic and refused to marry her um, because he, who knows exactly why, we can speculate what some of the reasons were. He says in an interview that, that it was because his family prohibited the relationship because he was from a, a good bourgeois family and that she was too bohemian and you know she was a woman of African descent and um, so there were these class and race differences between them. And so my students always wonder, well, how could she be such a feminist and, and write this strong poetry and, and still you know, follow this man around? And, um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of Puerto Rican women writers struggle with that question. There is an um, important Puerto Rican writer, Rosario Ferre, who says, um, she, she grapples with that legacy of Julia de Burgos as a feminist icon, um, Puerto Rican feminist icon, and says, and kind of makes her peace with Julia de Burgos in, in one of her writings by saying, you know, that perhaps we can't understand the kinds of pressures that you were under as a woman during that time period. It's not, it's not fair, perhaps, for us today with the liberties that we have to look back on that period and judge you for the decisions that you made. Um, but she certainly is a, a figure who's captured the imagination of these feminist writers, Puerto Rican writers in New York. There's um, a wonderful spoken word artist, Mariposa, who, who plays on this, um, the, the poem of Rio Grande de Loisa, where there's this beautiful description of the river, Mariposa, um, writes about the East River and Orchard Beach and, and makes those comparisons between the landscape of New York or the cityscape of New York and Puerto Rico and, and so identifies with her in that way. So they're really in, uh, still inspired by this figure. Any other comments or questions? I hope that um, maybe this will in, inspire you to go read uh, some of her work because she's a, a, fascinating, a fascinating figure and a really beautiful writer. And I think she's inspired a lot of people. So I hope that um, she'll also inspire you. Thank you.